All right, to talk more about the ongoing conflict, we're joined now by Yusuf Munir, who's head of the Palestine-Israel program at, Ar at Arab Center in Washington, D.C. Yusuf, uh, thank thanks so much for joining us. We were just saying that uh, you know, you're, you get very busy when violence breaks out uh, in, in the Middle East, and I, I know that must be a, a, a difficult place, a difficult role to kind of play in this, in this ecosystem. You know, um, my, my kids uh, know quite, quite young and are not aware of all the, the brutality that is taking place, but they understand um, that when, when Baba gets busy like this, something terrible is happening. Uh, in the region. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to many people over the last several days, and in many ways, it, it's, it's kind of a encapsulation of a, a bigger part of this problem. Um, time and time again, particularly when there are Israeli victims, um, people want to hear about the situation. Uh, but it is the long stretches of time in between the periods when my phone is ringing uh, that are the reason why this keeps happening. And um, in those periods of time, there's little attention paid to the situation on the ground that Palestinians are facing day in and day out underneath a system of structural violence. And, you know, we are witnessing now uh, a massive Israeli military operation that's about to take place in the Gaza Strip. It's already began with, with aerial bombardment over a thousand Palestinians have been killed, 5,000 uh, wounded, uh, and uh, electricity and water and fuel has been cut off to an already destitute uh, and desperate Gaza Strip. Um, this is going to be perhaps the 16th or 17th Israeli military operation in Gaza in the last 20 years. Each time, the Israeli military has said that their objectives are to um, attack the Palestinian militants, degrade their capabilities, and so on and so forth. And each time, um, Palestinian fighters end up showing that their capabilities are actually greater the next time around. There is no military solution to this, and I am deeply, deeply concerned that in this moment, particularly as American officials have given uh, complete backing to Israel, uh, that an Israeli government that is effectively led by uh, the most far-right and extremist constellation of Israeli politicians in its history uh, are going to be carrying out uh, unspeakable and unprecedented acts of mass atrocities in the Gaza Strip. Um, there is still time to avert further bloodshed. Uh, we can't go back in time and prevent what has already happened. Uh, but there is time to prevent this situation from becoming far far worse. And I think my message, and I think the message of all reasonable people in this moment, should be that um, we don't want to be remembered as the people who were silent before a genocide took place in the Gaza Strip. And this is what we are about to see, I fear. And we can put this up on the screen. You had a post that I, I really want to talk about here. Um, this is from Twitter or X. Uh, you responded to a tweet where somebody said, Israel is writing for a months-long ground campaign in Gaza. An Egyptian official tells the Times of Israel, saying that this message has been passed along from Jerusalem to Cairo. And you responded and said, it will likely be years. That question of what's to come, Youssef, uh, I want to give that question to you uh, while also asking, how you think uh, the Biden administration, the president himself, and Jake Sullivan, who uh, talked yesterday, Sullivan was actually answering questions from reporters, Biden gave prepared remarks. Um, what does the future look like in the context of what we've seen from the administration in the last 24 hours or so? You know, I think one of the most disturbing things we've heard from this administration is really a de-emphasis on the importance of the laws of war and the protection of civilians in the Gaza Strip. Uh, despite the fact that we have been hearing comments from Israeli officials at the highest levels about the need to flatten Gaza, about the need to eradicate people, about the need to uh, uh, target essentially the entire population. The defense minister announced uh, the collective punishment through the tightening of the siege, calling uh, the uh, population there beast people. Uh, you know, um, as, as someone who has studied mass atrocities and mass human rights abuses, 
periods of hysteria and dehumanization targeting an entire people often precede these kinds of events. Uh, and the Israeli military, as I said, is about to carry out this operation with full American backing uh, and, of course, additional uh, American weapons. Um, and I think this is something we must be urgently, urgently concerned about. And Yusuf, what is the, what is the effect of cutting off uh, food, power, uh, water, medical supplies at this point? And, it, and how long into this do we have to go before there are more lives lost from that than even the bombing? Well, that's that's something that's been happening throughout this. Of course, Gaza has been under a tight Israeli siege that has uh, just been tightened even further. Um, there were a few hours of electricity a day in Gaza preceding all of this, um, limited supplies coming in, and now uh, the tap has been closed entirely. Um, the effects of this are multifaceted, and all of them are devastating to the civilian population on the ground. Um, Hospitals right now are overwhelmed with victims. Uh, there are 5,000 Palestinian injuries as of this moment. And those numbers we know are going to rise significantly because so much of Gaza has been turned into rubble and they have no idea yet how many bodies lie beneath who is alive and who is, still, who is, who is not. Uh, those hospitals are going to cease functioning. Um, and when you target an entire population, including uh, the facilities that are used to save people's lives, you are, you are carrying out an atrocity. And again, this is something that the Israeli defense minister, that the U.S. government is standing in full solidarity with, announced his clear intention to do and took full responsibility for. Th this is unspeakable. And, you know, I fear that what we are about to, to see is going to make the events of the last several days um, seem like uh, a peaceful time gone past. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is one of the main impacts. The other one, which I think is extremely important too, and under-discussed at this time, is that there are very few Western reporters in the Gaza Strip right now. You look at all our American networks, nobody has anybody on the ground in the Gaza Strip. There are no eyes on what is going place, uh, go, uh, going on in that place. Some of the little evidence that we have of what is happening is coming through people who are recording and posting to social media on the ground in Gaza. They no longer have electricity. Their phones are going to die. Gaza becomes a black box in which the Israeli military has been given a green light to carry out mass atrocities. Again, there is time to still try to prevent more of this from taking place. So on the question of that green light, um, the sort of the, the U.S. government now looking at what the policy should be, the Israeli government on the ground say, you know, this is an ambush, a slaughter of hundreds of innocent people. Uh, we don't want to handcuff ourselves in, you know, war in a response to this. But Yusuf, um, how would you, I guess, counsel the United States uh, as it sort of, you know, we've heard the Lindsey Grahams, the saber rattling from people like him, from people like Nikki Haley. Um, on the other hand, those, you know, the, the, there are forces in our government right now negotiating with Israel, talking to Israel about how they're responding to this. So within that sort of context of Israel saying, on the one hand, there has to be a response. But on the other hand, you people in the United States saying we don't want to go full Lindsey Graham, full saber rattling, and uh, you know to quote some of the Israeli officials that you quoted earlier, you flatten uh, everything, uh, commit mass atrocities. Uh, what does that sort of look like? What, how can the United States have those conversations responsibly with people in Israel? You know, I don't know how many times, how many military operations have to be carried out um, in Gaza for people to understand that a military solution does not exist here. And this is a failure of policy as well. It's not just a failure of security. It's a failure of policy and it's a failure of imagination. There are alternatives to this, very clear alternatives that have always been present. Uh, we need to apply international law and demand it. You know, we cannot... Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, Americans say that we care about a rules-based international order uh, in Ukraine or, or wherever else, um, and then pretend that international law does not exist when it comes to the Palestinians. This siege of Gaza has been going on for a decade and a half. It's a brutal war crime. The occupation, the settlements, all of, all of this international law applies to. 
But, you know, our government, unfortunately, has turned a blind eye to that. Uh, if we are sending the message to Israelis and Palestinians that there are no rules, that no holds are barred, these are the kind of outcomes that we are going to see. And when it comes to American officials and some of their rhetoric, I have to say, including some of the politicians on the right, but not just politicians on the right, you know, the, the, the dangers of their rhetoric extend beyond the region. Uh, the dehumanization of Palestinians and, and of, of Arabs and Muslims more broadly um, is something we saw the impact of in the aftermath of 9-11 here in the United States, and we're likely to continue seeing that in the form of hate crimes against people who are part of that community. Um, and this is something I think that is wildly irresponsible on the part of our officials. Uh, and things very well could spin out of control, not just in the region, uh, but also here in the United States if this kind of language is repeated. And Yusuf, I, just, I think that just objectively speaking, the policy of siege and occupation and periodic invasion just objectively is not working. Like no, nobody would look at this situation, all the death that we've seen over the last week, and say that this is an acceptable price for whatever we have. So if we were going to use our imaginations in a broader way, you know, what would a, a different approach look like? Well, I think there are many people, unfortunately, Ryan, uh, including in Israel in particular right now, who are saying that the, the problem wasn't the siege, the problem was we haven't hit Palestinians hard enough, if you can imagine. Uh, and that the uh, only possible response can be to hit them harder because uh, violence is the only language they understand. This is, you know, this is the, the absolute lack of, of strategic vision on the part of the Israeli government. And it, it should be said here that the Israeli government has clearly failed their people, not just in this last week, uh, but in providing a vision for peace that could actually resolve the core issues here between Israelis and Palestinians. Again, it, this, it's, the path forward is not complicated. Um, international law and human rights are quite clear uh, on what is right and what is wrong, who is being denied, and those are the things that need to be resolved. Uh, Palestinians need to have freedom. You know, we in the United States uh, understand the importance of freedom. And when it is denied to people year in and year out, uh, forced to live under a military occupation, um, people are going to uh, oppose that. Um, and uh, Palestinians have been calling for the application of international law. They've been calling for the intervention of the international community. And they've been ignored year after year. Um, and so if, if anything is to come out of this horrific moment that we are witnessing, uh, I, I, I hope it is an understanding that by ignoring this issue, uh, we are not doing anybody any favors. Uh, and uh, Palestinian and Israeli alike are going to continue suffering uh, from violence that is the, the product of a system of occupation and apartheid. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's unconscionable that we could permit ourselves to do that. And, and last question, you know, the, the combination of there being no, you know, Western media in, in Gaza with the propensity of Twitter now to surface so much garbage and unverified stuff combined with propaganda coming from all sides has made it very difficult for people to follow this. So how do you, you know, how would you tell people who are watching this, who, who want to keep up with what's going on, uh, you know, where do you get your news and where, where would you recommend people go to get you know, some semblance of truth out of, out of this? I think it's important to try to hear directly from people in Gaza themselves who are telling you about what is happening there to the extent that we can. And it's become increasingly, increasingly difficult. I've seen people from Gaza send out messages that their phone batteries are about to die uh, and, and asking the world to remember them if they never hear from them again. Um, we need to look to international organizations who have credibility in documenting human rights abuses, international organizations like the United Nations who have been reporting and warning on the situation in Gaza for years, who have been ignored, as they've said, the situation has become increasingly um, unsustainable. And even when we don't have information coming to us, we need to use some common sense. We need to use some common sense about what is taking place on the ground, a place where two million people are trapped, and have been subjected to the most horrific and bizarre experiment in human history, uh, repeatedly bombed, uh, and uh, nothing good can be happening there, whether, you're, whether you are hearing news about it or not. Uh, we should expect that horrific things are, are taking place at this time. Well, Yusuf, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate 
appreciate you taking time out of your day. And of course, I'm going to see you later today uh, for my for my Intercept uh, podcast. Always good to talk to you, uh, even under these unfortunate circumstances. And thanks for bringing attention to this issue. All right. Well, that'll do it for us today. Uh, Emily, thanks for being here and slogging through this. This is this is uh, brutal. This is brutal stuff, and I, I hope that uh, Yusuf and my own uh, prediction of where this is going turns out to be untrue. Because, like, uh, like he was saying, we could look back on the last week and say, uh, "Man, I, I wish there was something we could do to get back the." tens of thousands of lives that were just lost. Absolutely, and as we've been talking about uh, all day, that would potentially not just be limited to this region, uh, and that can can ripple into a broader conflict. Uh, we have historical precedent for that. So uh, it's it, it certainly feels like the worst is yet to come, but hopefully it's not. We don't have to go over the brink. We don't no, have to don't go have over to. the brink, although that message so far in Eastern Europe has not been successful, and no. uh, it hasn't been successful in the region, the, in the Middle East, for, for years either when it comes to Israel and Palestine. So right. That'll do it for us, and uh, we'll, Breaking Points will be back tomorrow. We'll see you guys uh, next Wednesday. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.